Aha! Hello everyone! Rest of Aquamex here. I'm so sorry that the live stream kept uh, getting fried. It died like three times. But uh, finally we're back in the house. Um, and I'm glad that you're here. We actually have a lot of uh, questions from uh, Patreon uh, supporters and some things that I want to talk about there. And although some of them relate to silkworms, which is pretty cool. So welcome to Cloud 9.5, to Nezogaster, to Zero Cool. Uh, good to see you here. It looks like we got some people building up. So before we go any further, I would like to thank um, Susan. And I believe her, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce her last name, but I think it's Marquat, something like that. And she's from Beast Mode Silk. So I'm just going to show you the website right here on my phone. BeastModeSilks.com. You can see the little logo there with the chameleon. Pretty cool. And she sells uh, silkworms and silkworm chow and different things like that. Oh, Supreme Gecko is a favorite vendor. That's cool. And so if you want to try your hand at the, the silkworms, you can uh, come here. And apparently Beast Mode Silks has uh, different people who do different parts of the country it looks like that um, or you can go by state here and find out where um, they are and Susan Marquard, Marquard, Marquard I don't know how to say her last name exactly but she's the one who sent these to me and I, I would like to thank her for doing that and um, it's pretty pretty fun this whole this whole business with the silkworms has been cool she sent me food and everything so um, we can talk a little bit about all of that today. Um, I'm going to pull up the, the Patreon questions. Some of them relate to silkworms, as I was saying. And we'll, we'll cover the silkworm questions first. Uh, so I'm just going to, let's see, who we got? Frank the Tank, Crystals, Pets and Plants, Holly C, Newt's Commander, Dark World Stories, Keeping Bombardier Beetles, um, possibly. And Jamie Kellerman. Um, silkworms, don't they only eat mulberry leaves? Well, there are very few things that they do eat. Mulberry leaves are one. Mulberry-based chow is another one, which is what we've got there, here in the in the video. And then they'll also eat usage orange leaves sometimes, I guess. So, beetle breeding, Vincent, hello. Brian Davison, hi, welcome. Frank Detank, congratulations on your Dynasties grant. I beetles, that's so awesome. Ken Malinsky, welcome. And... Yeah, very cool. So, um, Benjamin um, Bramble has some questions about silkworms specifically. He said he's super interested in this one. He's going to miss it live, but wants to see how I raise them. Um, and he's saying that he, Benjamin, is experiencing issues with mold in the silkworm closure. Can I just culture or enclosure? Can I just add springtails? Also, I'm having issues with them not emerging from their cocoons. How long should I wait? Is there any special trick to it? So, let's talk about that for a second. I'll address that first question. The mold in the springtail, or in the silkworm enclosure, can I just add springtails? My understanding is that if there's mold in the spring, or I keep saying springtails because it's in the, in the post, sorry. If there's mold in the silkworm culture, um, then you are probably, you probably don't have enough ventilation in there. Um, you should probably increase the ventilation um, quite a bit because um, they need to be very dry. As you see here, I've got two layers of this stuff at present. Hopefully you can see that. Two layers of this mesh that keep them off the bottom so that the, it's difficult for mold to build up because there's going to be some air circulation flowing under there. And I have no top on here. I never do have a top on here. There's like no top. This is a six quart container with a smaller deli like takeout container inside it, no top, so that there's plenty of airflow. That's really what you want to do. Um, if it's molding, that the lack of ventilation and where the mold could be causing a problem, potentially, with them not emerging from the cocoons. I only have one cocoon. I saw somebody asking about it because I'm just starting out with uh, silkworms. These are my first silkworms I've ever had, the first batch. You can see that there's various sizes. and uh, But you can see on the right, right here, got our first cocoon, which it started spinning yesterday. So that's kind of exciting. I'm pretty, uh, pretty excited about it. 
I think you can see some movement in there. I think it's still building the cocoon, actually. Yeah, you can, you can see some of the movement in there. Um, when I left this morning, it, there was just kind of a, a loose tent. And then I came back today, and it's, uh, it's much uh, more complete, but it's not done. But like I said, I'm, I'm a beginner. It should only take between 18 and 20 days for them emerge from there. For, ah, sorry, my mouth today. For them to emerge from the cocoons. So it could be that they need a little bit more uh, ventilation, possibly. But like I said, I'm not an expert on that part as I've just started. But uh, I do, I have learned uh, from the research that I've done that they really, really need a lot of ventilation. And where I am in Utah is pretty dry. Benjamin's in the same state. So it's pretty dry. So we actually need to replace our food more often than you would in a more humid state because this food desiccates pretty fast here. Cool thing about this food that I learned from Ray Tripp. He's been in the live streams before. He lives near me and has raised these before. Um, we uh, were talking about this and he said this dried up food, you can throw it to your isopods. So I have been giving it to the isopods and they really eat it. They really enjoy it. I mean, it's a large proportion of what this is, is mulberry leaves. So mulberry leaves are good for isopods, so it's pretty cool. Um, the isopods don't care if it's dry. The uh, silkworms don't eat it when it's dry. So it's kind of a, a good way to recycle it. I've, I've given quite a bit of it to my isopods, and they seem to like it. Um, so let's go back to that question that uh, Benjamin Bramble said. Interested to see how you raise them. Okay, well, this is what I've done so far. When I got them, these, the biggest ones were smaller than that really small one right there. I mean, they were really tiny. They were probably half that size, maybe. And there were more of them. I have fed some off, and some have died. And this is, you know, it's a new thing for me. I'm learning this. So Susan sent me this, this container with um, the mesh and everything. And with some food, she sent a, a pouch of food similar to this one. I have since bought more food, but... Um, uh, bag of food that came with them and what you do is you take this powder and you add it to boiling water you put about I think it's one scoop of the chow to about two scoops of um, boiling water and then you cover it and then you put it in the microwave and microwave it for a short time depending on how much you're making and you can make uh, up a big batch and put it in the fridge ahead of time or you can make a smaller batch every day it's kind of up to you it's probably more practical to mix up a batch and then keep it in the fridge um, for a little while. And it can last, um, it can last there uh, for some time. And then you just portion it out like you see here. And you sort of distribute it among the different uh, silkworms so everybody can get some because they don't really move a whole lot from where they are. They tend to stay kind of in one place to some degree. And so you want to kind of spread it out You give that to them. And here in Utah, it lasts about a day, then it dries up too much, and then you need to replace it with new stuff, uh, the new silkworm chow. And you do that about every day. If you miss a day or so, it's going to slow down their growth. It won't necessarily kill them, but it'll certainly slow them down. The best thing for them is to just feed them every day, or at least make sure they're eating food every day. If you live in a humid state, you could probably feed them every other day because they're still going to be able to eat what you fed them. This, I just fed them an hour or so ago. So it's going to be good until sometime tomorrow. And then every week to two weeks, which is really pretty incredible, you, there's not a lot of maintenance involved in cleaning them up. You basically take them carefully. You remove... There's, this is nested inside another tray of the same size. You can see the clear tray underneath it in the corner here. And you, you gently kind of... You can take this, this mesh up, lift it up, set it down inside the other tray, remove whatever of the dried food that you can get rid of, a few bits left over, as you can see, I left a few bits there, is fine. And then you lift everything off, put it in the clear tray, and then dump out the other tray, dump out the frass and everything, and rinse it out, then dry it out, and then put it back in. And that's basically what you do for care. It's pretty simple. Um, I'm still getting to the, you know, the, the cocooning part and all of that, but as far as maintenance of the worms themselves, pretty simple. So far as feeding goes, I have fed off a couple to my jumping spiders, my Phidippus regis and my Phidippus audax. They've both eaten it. And, and uh, I fed off some to the morning geckos. And I'm trying to remember what else. I think I may have fed some off to another gecko as well, but I don't remember now. Um, but pretty cool. 
it's been fun. So hopefully, Benjamin, that helps with your question. Now I'm going to move on to Eileen's question. Eileen asked a question on my first post, I think it was. Okay, and then we'll talk about Brian's questions. He had some questions too. So Eileen has an unrelated question, not related to Silkworm, says, I know we've gone over this before, but I'm having trouble finding the live stream of it. Where do mites that often invade springtail cultures come from? I know that the once they invade, it's best to get rid of the culture altogether, but I don't know what to do or not to do to keep them from entering in the first place. They always just seem to pop up all of a sudden. Thanks. P.S. I do wonder if they're inside aspen bedding, which I sometimes drop in their cultures, which has snake poop I feed to them. This is just a theory. That is possible. Mites are very ubiquitous. If if there's enough humidity to support them, they'll they'll be almost anywhere. So the types of grain mites that show up are in food items. They are in in our houses, in places where it's humid enough. They're almost everywhere. So it's really, really difficult to uh, avoid getting them in there. I have found that the best thing for me to do is avoid grain-based foods because they often do come in grain-based foods. So I don't feed any grain-based foods to my springtails. And then uh, I keep them sealed tightly, except when I have them open to feed or ventilate. And it, basically feeding and ventilation happen at the same time. Um, and, but there's, there are no holes in the container. When it's sealed, it's a, it's a food saver container. It's very tightly sealed. So um, I think that is the best thing you can do to keep them out. Um, so the food that I use contains green pea powder um, nutritional yeast and spirulina powder and some I put in some Rapashi calcium plus too a little bit and I usually keep those ingredients well I keep some of them refrigerated and that helps I think but I make sure those are also tightly sealed and that seems to help keep the the mites out those two things keep the food tightly sealed don't use grain based food and then um, keep the container the culture container tightly sealed actually so, hopefully that helps, Eileen. Great question. So, next question is from Brian. Um, he was mentioning, he was referring to the fact that I posted on Patreon a picture of me at Clint's Reptile Room. And some of you may have seen some other pictures from that time on Instagram. And I was really excited to visit Clint's Reptile Room, and I, was, I really, really enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun. I went with my sons. I want to go back again with my wife and daughters, too. Um, it was so fun. I can't even believe how delightful it was. it was. It's really hard to even explain how fun it was. Very, very fun. But I, I enjoyed talking to Clint. He, he's amazing. He's, if it's possible, he's even more fun in person. Then he is on his videos, and he's amazing fun on his videos. And meeting all the creatures there was just fantastic. So um, it was it was like Christmas, birthday, all rolled into one, just seriously. I, I had so much fun. But uh, Brian was asking, does his rating system stand up to your personal experience? So the rating system he uses in, in his videos. I would say so. I haven't kept everything that he's done videos on, of course. But on the things that he has done videos on and I have kept... I, I usually tend to agree closely with, with what he says. So yeah, I think, I think he's, uh, he's amazing and he's got great experience with, with these kinds of things. So I would say so. And then um, Brian had another question, but it's posted elsewhere, so I'm checking it out. I'm finding it. Okay. Um, so Brian also said, are there precautions or care advice uh, for newly received reptiles? What if there have been shipping delays and you can assume the animals are in a state of distress? And that is definitely a, a concern if they, there have been shipping delays, and it does happen, which is terrible uh, when it happens, but it can happen. Um, I would say there are a couple things. One, when you open it up, if you think there's a large temper, temperature differential, um, I would personally... Um, open the container and let it sit at room temperature for just a few minutes to try to mitigate that temperature differential just a little and then try to assess what kind of distress the animals are in. Um, get them into their containers but into their enclosures which is probably a quarantine enclosure in many cases depending on how many reptiles you already have and whatnot. But um, moving them into 
that container with as little stress to them as possible, meaning if they're in a deli cup, open the deli cup and leave it open in there so that they can crawl out on their own when they're ready. Um, make sure that they are that they have access to hydration as, as soon as possible because a lot of times some of the stress that comes from shipping stress is temperature stress and some of it is hydration stress. So assess that. I mean, you can kind of get a, a little bit of an idea by looking at them how advanced any dehydration issues might be. Um, but make sure that they have access to hydration immediately, but also make sure they have a place to get out of that. So I would mist like a plant-rich area of the enclosure. And Brian, I believe you're doing you're going to put yours directly into a planted enclosure so mist some of the leaves and then leave another area dry and put them where they can access both of them and just keep a close eye on them really if they're moving around um, a lot and they don't look like visibly dehydrated they're probably going to be fine as long as temperature stress hasn't been a big issue um, but that that is what i would do i don't think um, there's a lot more else than that that i would do in your particular case and i hope that helps now let's see and let me know if you want um, some more information on that i'm trying to make sure i cover everything okay so hopefully that helps brian i'm going to uh try to catch up a little bit on the chat because i think i've covered all the patreon questions so let's see um dark world story oh we did talk about the biodome with the complete ecosystem i do remember talking about that i don't remember too many specifics but i do remember that so rodrigo is Peter going to sell velvet worms? I think so. I think that's what he said recently. And Frank the Tank, that is awesome. I remember that, <coughs> excuse me, you're talking about that in the chat with the assassin bug eggs. So I'm glad that worked out. Formal Top Pat is in the house too. Cool. And yeah, one thing about silkworms, the adults don't live a long time. They mate, they lay eggs, then they don't last very long after that. And Brian, they don't seem to try to crawl away. The only one that I've had go very far is this one over here that pupated. And it didn't go very far. I, I put this bit of netting over it because it looked like it might be trying to crawl out, but it ended up pupating right there. So they don't go very far. And so I'm not actually farming silk so much as I'm trying to culture silkworms. And this is my first experience, so I'm learning. But we'll see how it goes. Therapod Hunter, Gemma, hello. Um, so Frank the Tank, you want to keep stick insects? Can't find the leaves that they eat in my area, nor can find any plants for sale without pesticides they could eat. Ah, uh -huh. and are you in the UK, Frank the Tank? I'm trying to remember. So Heather Jensen, what are we feeding the silkworms to? I fed them. I fed a couple to my jumping spiders. I fed some to my morning geckos when they were little, and I think. I'm trying to remember. I seem to have a memory of feeding them to another gecko, but I'm not sure. But they would definitely be a good food for crested geckos and leopard geckos as well. Okay, Frank, to thank you are in the U.S. Okay, well, um, hmm, they're tough to get here without the permit process is going to be a little bit tough. But if you can do that, um, you can use the Himalayan blackberry if you can get a hold of it, and that grows like a weed. Literally, it is a weed in many places. So. Um, that can be a good one for many of the species. Maybe not all of them, but... Um, hey, Link Z, you found a yellow velvet ant. Cool. That's awesome. I'm glad the video helped. Did, is it a Dazimutilla... Um, let's see. Dazimutilla vestita, perhaps? Uh, hold on just a second. I've got a little issue here. Does that mean my light bulb's gone out? What does this mean? Hmm, I'm not sure. Just doing a quick check on my lighting, sorry. Um, that's what's going on, okay. Hmm, my lighting's goofy, I'm gonna have to fix that later. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so, Dark World Stories. Cool. So Dark World Stories, you've already got the math down. That's that's good. That's kind of a hard part. And you're thinking about insects to put in it. So remind me how big it's going to be. So Therapod Hunter, feather millipedes and velvet ants in the UK. Yeah, I can imagine that'd be a little hard. And is the stream cutting off? Sorry about that. There's something going on that's a little weird. 
Um, I couldn't get onto the stream for, for a while at first. It was weird. So, Heather Jensen, Pac-Man and Cuban frogs loving the silkworms. Awesome. I guess when I just hatch them out when they're really tiny, I could try them with the dart frogs and see if they like them. They'd have to be really, really tiny, but it could be doable. If I'm hatching, you know, 600 eggs, I could feed off 100 or so and not worry about it. So that makes sense. Do you raise silkworms too, Heather? Ooh, sorry. I'm just checking to see if there are any more um, Patreon questions in here. You know, for those of you who haven't seen it, here's me at Clint's Reptile Room with Bubba Chunk, the snapping turtle. It was so fun to meet him. Um, I don't have the uh, correct software on my iPad, at least it's not set up right now, to uh, be able to show pictures in a more high-tech fashion, but this was so fun. It was, it was amazing. And I'm looking forward to going back in the future. Okay. So, Heather. Um, okay, you just feed them off sometimes for your frog and toad and stuff. That makes sense. Oh, it was a pretty hefty, it was a pretty hefty uh, snapping turtle. Um, I, it had some, some heft to it for sure. <laughs> Um, Beckett Barnes, do you have any centipedes? Not at the moment. I have in the past. I want to again. Um, you know, as it, when I was at Clint's Reptile Room, he had some in some really cool enclosures. And I thought, he had one in a really cool enclosure. And I thought, you know, I'm going to try an enclosure like that. I want to do that with a centipede. Because it looked very escape-proof and uh, also very easy to see. Um, so it would make a good display enclosure for a centipede. And yeah, I think these silkworms are pretty easy to breed there, Pond Hunter. It's, it's fun. Yeah, Mother of Isopods, I agree with you. Clint is awesome. And it was... I just... You should have seen my face. I mean, you probably saw it in the picture, except it was masked up. But anyway, it was fun. And uh, mixed chalky. You know, it's funny. I kind of like how silkworms look. They're interesting. My wife and my daughter were saying I was giving them food and stuff before the live stream, and they're like, those things look creepy now. They were kind of cute when they were little, but now they look creepy. <laughs> so, um, so Beckett, what species are you looking for uh, centipede-wise? I might have a couple of options for you. Oh, Therapon Hunter, you're going to breed and release solitary bees. That's pretty cool. You know, uh, my cousin who did the Velvet Ant uh, live stream with us, who's the entomologist, specialist in uh, wasps of various sorts and bees. He has plans for building a mason bee uh, mason bee house that um, encourages various solitary mason bees to come uh, set up nests in it. And so I w I've been meaning to do that for a couple of years and I haven't done it yet. So PJ Bailey, I am going to let some of them more morphous into moth moths to see if I can get a new generation going. So you can see there's one cocoon right here it being formed. You can see that the, the uh, larva is still in there spinning the silk, uh, finishing up that cocoon. So I'm going to try it, see how it goes. Oh, okay. That is a pretty big project, Dark World Stories. That's, um, yeah, I'm wondering what kind of things you're going to put in there. I would definitely say you got to put some ice pods in there. I mean, Maybe that's obvious, but I would put isopods and springtails for sure. I know those aren't, you know, isopods are not insects, and technically, depending on who you talk to, springtails are columbulate hexapods and not technically insects, but it depends on who you talk to. But I think both of those should go in there for sure. So Frank Tank, yeah, you know, they're actually centipedes, fairly big centipedes, Scolopendra polymorpha, not far away from where I live, and they're also tarantulas very close to where I live. I mean... I can drive five minutes and get to where tarantulas are. I don't see them very often, but I have. Uh, last, a couple of years ago, I saw a male tarantula out, you know, looking for a girlfriend, um, just very close to my house. And Anthony Ruth, why are silkworms expensive but easy to breed? Good question. Well, I don't know. It, it may be partly because 
Um, they're fairly easy to take care of, but it, there is some expense required to raise them because the uh, silkworm food is not uh, not that cheap, honestly. So that might be partly why. Ashy mining bees. I'm going to have to check those out there, Pod Hunter. Oh, yeah. Hornworms are very expensive. When I've seen them in the pet store, I'm like, wow, I could almost go out to eat for that much. And they do look really cool as moths, so I'm excited to look at that. So Beckett, a big communal centipede project. Ooh, which species? There aren't very many species I know of that you can do communal, but I know there are some. Like Ricida longipes can work, and there's one of the uh, one of the Vietnamese centipedes. Is it Morsitans? Scolopendra Morsitans? Is that the one? And thank you, Crystal, for the like spike suggestion. Very good idea. And Anthony with hornworms in the garden. There you go. So Frank the Tank, increasing the Tarantula Collection. Cool. Do you subscribe to the Tarantula Collective? He's got a cool channel going on. So Mother of Isopods. Oh, yeah. I guess uh, hornworms would be easy to breed. I haven't tried them, but that's, that's worth thinking about. Oh, Lithobius. Beckett. Okay, got it. Yes, Lithobius. They are indeed communal. That's true. I can go find those guys in my backyard, and they are... Uh, they, they tend to be in larger groups, so that makes sense. So silkworms eat mostly just two things, although I read that they can eat usage orange leaves as well, but mostly mulberry leaves and mulberry chow, which is based on mulberry leaves. So this comes as a powder that you hydrate and cook, and it's mostly mulberry leaves, but it has some other things in there as well. So Beckett Barnes, okay, 26 and a 10 gallon, wow. I'd be interested to see if you get babies in there. That would be interesting. Um, the Ricida longipes get about three, three and a half inches, something like that. And they're supposed to be communal as well. I've thought about setting up uh, something like that. They do have kind of a, it's not a super bad bite, but it's uh, worse than, you know, Lithobius or something like that. I have been bitten by Lithobius, the only centipede I've been bitten by. As far as I know, I may have been bitten by a Scolopendra polymorpho when I was a kid. Not sure, because I wasn't very good at identifying centipedes back then. Been bitten by a couple, but I think, just in retrospect, the one that one of the ones that bit me was too big to be a Lithobius. And then the Lithobius bit me, too, and both of them kind of hurt, but not nothing serious. So, couldn't eat Rapashi bug gel for Anthony. For the, no, apparently there are enzymes in the mulberry leaves that they need, and if they don't get it... They don't do well. In fact, it, they generally tend to die. So they will eat other things, but it's not going to sustain them. So Heather, you got a few tropical plants? Didn't smuggle home any Florida lizards or millipedes, unfortunately. You know, that happens. Uh, people have contacted me about that before when they, they get a, an accidental lizard or something like that. But uh, yeah, it totally does happen. Um, that's pretty cool. I'm glad you were able to find some cool plants. Whoa, Therapod Hunter, those ashy mining bees sound really pretty. So Beckett, at least I've seen at least one person have success breeding the Ricida longipes in a communal setup, and they seem to do well. It was the centipede whisperer. He's kind of out of the business now, but I actually purchased some uh, vinegaroons from him quite a few years ago some captive bred vinegaroons. He was captive breeding various centipedes as well as vinegaroons and other things. Autumn Sky. Oh, that's awesome. I'm glad that's uh, succeeding f for you. Yeah, um, my cousin actually has a... He's got a web site. Well, he's got a YouTube channel and an Instagram channel or an Instagram account. Um, it's called The Bees in Your Backyard, and he actually does a video detailing how to uh, build the mason bee house, too. So, Oh, cool, Autumn Sky, helping the bats. That is really cool. So, Anthony, the, the food, I think the last time I bought a pound of food was... Um, it was like 13 or $14 for a pound of the food, so, you know, more expensive than some other foods.
And Dark World Sky, yeah, probably is going to take a while. That's true. Yeah, vinegaroons are really cool. I had some for a number of years, and I don't have any anymore. They eventually passed on, but I want to get some more. And Frank to Tank. That is cool. You had you had an adult vinegaroon there. Vinegaroons are pretty amazing. And, you know, Dark World Stories, I've been wanting to do something like that for years, too. Anthony Ruth, how to get picky captive bred bluegill to eat pellets? Hmm. Well, a couple of ideas for you there. One, you could try soaking the pellets with a little bit of chopped garlic, because garlic is uh, an appetite stimulant. You could try um, using a, a really smelly type of fresh food, something like you know, mysa shrimp or bloodworms or something, and soaking some frozen um, bloodworms in water and then soaking the pellets in that and then putting the pellets in before you put the other food in. After they've, you know, hadn't eaten for a day or two, try that. See if that helps. Um, those are kind of some of my go-tos uh, for getting things, getting fish to eat pellets when they're not doing it. Um, and see if that, that helps. And remember, it's okay for a bluegill, um, you know, most fish that are not fry, to go without eating for a couple of days to kind of help sharpen their appetite. That's not a, not generally a problem. So, worth a try. So, any suggestions for, for top few tortoises to keep outside in summer and inside in hibernation time? Hmm. Great question, but I, I don't feel qualified to answer that one because I haven't worked with tortoises. Well... I haven't worked with tortoises to that degree. Um, when I worked at a zoo, I did feed tortoises and stuff like that, but it's not the same thing. So I, I feel like it's a great question, but I don't know that I could answer it. Oh! Scolopocrytops sexpinosis is a cool centipede. Um, sounds pretty neat. I've thought about keeping those too. Hammerhead worms ever been considered in the hobby? Hammerhead worms. Which ones are those? I That sounds familiar to me. So, Paraplanata Missionary views flake foods with bluegills, too. Cool. That's worth a try. I have had African dwarf frogs. They're pretty cool. I even had a pair that um, produced uh, tadpoles for me. And I was not prepared for the tadpoles, so I didn't successfully raise them. But I uh, they surprised me with some eggs and tadpoles. It was kind of fun. Well, that would be cool, Dark Word Stories. I would love to see it. They only eat cut in half waxworms. That is... That is interesting. I wonder why. Some, some centipedes are picky. Oh, cool, Heather. You had Endangered Blandings Turtles breeding program. That's awesome. So, Crystal, do you have the big African clod frogs? The, the big ones, Xenopus, like Xenopus lavis, or another Xenopus species? I'm not attacking any food at all. We had a centipede that was weird about food. She would attack it sometimes, and other times she would go a long time without attacking. It was really weird. And Armadillidium vulgare, welcome. Glad you cut a live stream. So yeah, Paraplaneta missionary. My uh, when I was a kid, my neighbor caught a bluegill. We put it in a tank, and it it ate like a pig too. So I'm not sure what's going on here. And Newt's commander, welcome back. How's your gargoyle gecko doing? Yeah, I think. You know, once I had some bettas that were being picky and would not eat pelleted food. And so I just waited a few days and fed them the pelleted food. And then they ate it. And after that, they would eat it. They just were not that hungry, so they didn't care. Um, so your bluegill... Oh, well, if they're eating... You're saying they don't eat the new life spectrum pellets that you soaked and got it. Got it. But they are eating the flakes. Well, you're probably fine then if they're eating the flakes. Um... 
And you're welcome, Autumn Sky. Oh, you tried not letting them eat for a few days? It didn't work, huh? Ah, crystals, pets, and plants. Good idea to keep them apart because they will eat anything that's smaller than they are and sometimes things that are bigger than they are. Oh, so Newt, you have a new gargoyle gecko. I see what's going on. That's cool. I've I've worked with training bettas to do tricks, Frank to Tank. They're they're fun to train. I trained one to flare based on a hand signal. That's probably one of the most fun ones that I did. It would uh I'd just do this little hand signal to it and it would uh actually flare every single time. <laughs> it was cool. Okay, Anthony, so they're they're eating krill, they're eating flake, they're eating live foods. Oh, that's not too bad, really. Hey, you can give them a pretty balanced diet if you've got them on a staple of flake, and then you can get them on those other foods. I've had uh, fish that don't accept new life spectrum all that well myself. And others that, of course, munch it down without a problem. So, interesting, Beckett, that the scolopole cripe tops are, are working for you together and frank to tank yeah yeah bigger tank is better with bettas for sure if you can do it uh, my daughter got a, a betta and we put it in a 20 gallon and it was just most of the time in there by itself or with you know some small cleanup crew things but um and it lived a good long life i've had other bettas in smaller tanks than that that did fine too but it's nice if they have a large tank so Therapod Hunter, your dairy cows are eating fish food, but your others won't? You know, my, my powder blues go crazy over it, and so do my clowns. But I guess it partly depends on what food, what fish food you're using. I don't really use flakes, I use pellets. And I use uh, Omega-1 pellets, and they, pretty, they go pretty crazy over it. Almost all of my isopods do. But that doesn't mean that all of them will. Oh, they eat the hornworms from your garden, too. So they're getting a pretty good diet. And Therapod Hunter, I actually do fish food with my red tigers, and they eat it. And Jay Perkins, hello. So glad you found some babies. That's awesome. And Autumn Sky, that, that often does work, yes. Oh, there you go, Heather. I think we talked about that at one point. Yeah, that's a good good suggestion. You just throw the sawdust in with the isopods and they eat whatever waxworm remains are in there and they can eat the sawdust as it decomposes. So Beckett, um, to get centipedes, um, Bugs in Cyberspace, of course, is great. And he does have centipedes um, fairly often. He doesn't always have them, but uh, nobody always has them almost. But uh, he's a great source. If uh, you want to look for centipedes, he often has Scolopendra polymorpha and um, some other species sometimes. Uh, you can look at Xeric Bayou. And uh, let's see. Actually, arachnoboards.com is not a bad place to look. You can put an ISO, an in search of, in the uh, classifieds there and say, I'm looking for centipedes, and you can often get some help there. Okay, tarantula B, hello. Oh, Crystal, you give them crab food too. That makes sense for your isopod. So powdered isopods are pretty ferocious in their in eaters. Yep, yep. I would say some of my most voracious eaters among my isopods are powders. Uh, Porcelio ornatus yellow dot and Porcelio lavis milkback and Porcelio lavis dairy cow. Oh, tarantula bee, awesome. Porcelia Hoffman's egg guy babies. Okay, so Beckett. Ah, I see what you're saying. Peter doesn't have them right now. Okay. Um, well, you can check out Zeric Bayou. They, it's X-E-R-I-C space B-A-Y-O-U. Zeric Bayou, Sam Floyd. Um, if you can't find him, then send me a message on Instagram. And I will send you his uh, price list from there. And yeah, sometimes Porcelio Hoffman's egg can take a while, so I'm glad they're working for you there, Tarantula B. Why are your water lettuce leaves white and curly? Well, Anthony, 
Water lettuce, for me, I have found, and I think other people have said this too, water lettuce really likes a lot of light, it really likes a lot of fertilizer, and it really likes to be, to have the top of its leaves stay pretty dry. Uh, so I would say if it's too humid in there or if water is getting dripped or splashed on them frequently, they hate that. So um, let me know how that's going. I have my goldfish tank, my 54 gallon goldfish tank has like a carpet of water lettuce and I'm literally scoop out, most weeks I scoop out like a third of them every week and I give it a lot of fertilizer partly because there are goldfish in there and partly because I put, I add fertilizer twice a week but also um, it's got a really pretty bright light in there and they grow like crazy um, but I try to keep water from splashing on their leaves. And that seems to be good. That seems to help. And Frank to Tank, yes, you do need some Hoffman's egg guy. So, so Dark World Stories, my opinion on Androniscus dentiger and the good ice pods. I've never kept that species, so I don't have a lot to say about it, unfortunately. Jay Perkins, congrats on the Panda Kings. That's awesome. I think sometimes when we... Uh, leave our ice pods alone for a little while and then we look at them that's when we find the babies it's true so let's see i'm going to let's i want to try something i'm going to see if i can show you my powder i mean my oreo crumbles i saw some babies in here the other day or at least one baby the uh they breed really fast the species is really prolific but they don't seem to have large litters but they reproduce so frequently that it doesn't seem to matter so this is the tarantula cribs enclosure that uh, I got from tarantula cribs. They were kind enough to send this to me and uh, I decided to put some powders in there, the powder Oreo crumbles. And just the other day I saw babies. So let's take a peek. See what we can see. There's an adult running around right there. I love the look of them, by the way. It's funny because you don't notice how dark the uh, color is on the on this species until they have light patches on them and then it gives more contrast and it shows up better. It's kind of cool. They look more interesting that way, I think. Let's see if we have any babies showing up here. I see a bunch of springtails running around. Um, hmm. But I'm not seeing any babies right now. But I did see some evidence of babies the other day. So... There we go. Might as well check. So, Sean Meister, welcome. So, Porcelio nickels eye, tarantula bee. I have not kept that species. They seem like a really interesting one. And they, I believe, a subspecies or at least closely related to Porcelio bolivari or. Bolivari, however you say it. Um, but I don't, I haven't kept that species. Let me close this down here. Okay. I'm going to go get a different isopod now. There, got the lid on. We put these back. You can look at that leaf litter. Isn't that fascinating? While I move across the room here. I'm going to pick up my Porcelio Hoffman's egg eye black. Take a look at those. Maybe somebody else too. Because um, Heather was asking about Porcelio Hoffman's egg eye black. And I've got them now. Got them from Finger Lakes Feeders not too long ago. So let's see. So I'm not quite done, Nicholas. Welcome. I will be around for a while. And. Okay, Jay got some black Hoffman's egg eye. These are babies, of course, young ones, but these are black Hoffman's egg eye. You can't tell with the color quite as much when they're younger. I mean, you can a little bit, but you can see that their their margins or, or skirts are pretty narrow on these. Seem to be doing really well. Haven't had any losses. I see a lot of frass down here. So they seem to be um, eating well. There's some in here too. I got really good numbers from Scott at uh, Finger Lakes Feeders. 
and they seem to be doing really really well um, but they're young so they you know they're not breeding yet so let's see So Brian was asking about springtails in the enclosure with the uh, the Oreo crumbles. In and I think it's the same species that I've got in here. I'm not entirely sure about that, but I have two species of springtails. But the ones that were in that enclosure with the uh, Oreo crumbles are Sinella curvaceta, as far as I know. That's the species I believe them to be, and uh, they're a great species for isopods. I prefer that species to any other because they um, actually have a wide range of humidity tolerances. They seem to outcompete other springtails. And uh, so yeah, I, I think I have some of that same species in here with my expanses. Let's let's see. Look at all these expanses. Little baby expanses. Some bigger expanses. None of these are fully grown yet. But some of them are obviously breeding age. Uh, let's see. There's a whole bunch more. Look at all these guys. Doing really well. I'm actually not seeing a whole lot of springtail action in here. I did put some in here, and I'm sure there are some. I'm just not seeing a whole lot right now. Let's see. Some more little babies down there. There's babies everywhere. I love that they're reproducing so well in here. I, I do see a couple of springtails. I'm not sure if you can see them. But, uh, yeah. Usually I'll see some really small juveniles. Much smaller than the ones I'm, I'm seeing now. On some of these other pieces of bark in here. I don't want to disturb them too much. But lots of little baby expenses in here. And lots of bigger expenses. So I'm going to put this, turn this upside down again so that they can be comfortable. I don't want to freak them out. Make sure everybody can find a, a comfortable spot to hang out. Okay, so. Um, European night crawlers are super hard to keep indoors, um, Anthony. So that could be uh, part of the issue there. I use frass, Heather, as fertilizer once I freeze it, my isopod frass, freeze it for 72 hours because my permit requires me to do that. And then I put it in uh, the garden or at least in a flower bed or something of that nature. And it works pretty well. Let's see. I'm going to pull out a couple of more isopods just to check on them as we're talking here. So, so Brian, which one get about the enclosure more? Um, there are quite a few that that do that, and I can maybe recommend some other species that do as well. Oh, seed shrimp are awesome forest oasis, especially the big ones. And Peter does call the expenses Beetlejuice isopods. Here are some red faced Dubrovnik uh, armadillidium klugai. I'm just kind of checking in, seeing if they're babies. There are uh, some springtails. This is the Sinella curvaceta springtail um, that we were talking about, Brian. And they do seem to be they seem to be faster movers and just more a little bit more aggressive about food and stuff. And so, yeah, I, I think they're a good good species for that. So Francisco Leon, what was my first invertebrate? Good question. Probably sea monkeys, honestly. You know, brine shrimp, artemia. I, I probably kept those before I kept any other invertebrates as pets, like seriously kept them. Um, but actually, I don't know. It might have been a mantis. It's probably one of those. And that would be cool for us to always say, yeah, 
Forest Oasis. I'd like to get a start of the Ostracods. That would be cool. So J, you know, I need to count how many I have, how many colonies I have. It's somewhere about, uh, somewhere around 40 different types, I think, but more enclosures than that, for sure. More enclosures. Um, let's see. I honestly don't uh, know exactly. I haven't counted in a while, so does take a while, but I have my kids, you know, I pay them to help me take care of them. So that helps. So Anthony, I don't know. Um, my understanding is that the, the, the night crawlers just don't do well in at indoor temperatures and without really deep mineral rich soil. But, you know, I, I can't say for sure how they will do. Here's my uh, California mix. You can see a couple of offspring. This is Porcelia lavis. Um, I love the colors on these guys. Some of them look like almost orange milk backs to me. Like the one on the right there. And there's a little little baby running around. Um, but the one on the right that's not moving and the one on the left that's kind of hiding. Uh, they're really cool looking. And there's some that are kind of white and there are different colors in here. And there's actually quite a few babies. I don't see a lot of them right now, but I was in here the other day and there were, ooh, that's not what I meant to do. Hopefully everybody's okay there. Didn't mean to knock everybody down. I don't want to squish anybody. I'm going to set that like that. That'll probably do it. Put the lids back on. Yeah, I really like the California mix so far. I haven't had it for long. Just got it at an expo recently, but I like it. Um, and then let's look at the Porcelio Levis milk back crossing with the Porcelio Levis orange. Trying to, anyway. Let's see what we got here. Uh, there are definitely babies in here. I saw quite a few babies the other day. Um, the thing is, the babies are so young, it's hard to tell if. Can you see those babies down there? You can see a few of them probably crawling around near the bottom. But they're too young to tell if they're really, if the, any of them are have actually successfully crossed or if we're just getting two different strains going on in here without any crossing. I'm not sure. So, let's see. And Therapod Hunter, that's the uh, Extinct in the Wild Roach, isn't it? That's a pretty cool one. Okay, I think we have time for a couple more isopods. Uh, I don't know, Heather, I'm wondering about it. What I would expect is if that were the case, if the genes responsible for orange or spots don't allow the other phenotype expression, then we would just get wild types um, in the first generation. But, um, and that would happen even if we, they did and they were just single gene recessive. So either way, that's what I would expect to see. But, so I'm curious about that. What's the fungus that kills frog? Because I treated mine with malachite green. Is it chytridium? Chytridium chytrid fungus is, is a bad one. Look at that gorgeous creature there. I think I'm going to have monkey really soon because I saw a female with a marsupium not long ago. I don't want to mess with these too much, but I'll take a look and see how they're doing. I love the the high high yellow. Just they're fantastic looking in the Porcelia lavis or in Porcelia lavis, Porcelia ornatus. There's a bunch of them there. I've not seen a single monka yet, but from what I've read, they're fairly large. They're still, you know, small, but they're fairly large for the size of the uh, isopods. There's an example of the Sinella curvaceta springtails again. A little bit of mold on growing on the wood, and they're going after it. It looks like so. 
that is good. I'm going to set this little one down here. Just scoop a little bit of moss out of the way and see what I see. I see a bunch of springtails. I don't see any, any monkey yet. But looking forward to that. And when, when they finally get here. A very cool species. I really like uh, the species with yellow markings. And speaking of yellow markings, maybe this will be our last species that we look at. It's just nuts. I mean, look at how many of these Armadillidium gestroi I have. There's so many, and there's a ton in the substrate too. Fantastic species, breeding really well. And yeah, the uh, Porcelia nautis are pretty big. Huh. The little plant baskets are climbing on it, huh? That's cool. Sorry that's not focusing very well on these guys. I don't know why. Let's see if that works any better. That's a little better. And just look at that. Those little yellow wedges are the coolest thing. Some people call it green. I don't know. What, is, what does it look like to you? Since I'm, you know, partially colorblind, I see it. It's a bright color, but whether it's yellow or green is kind of up in the air to me, so. It just looks gorgeous, whatever color it is. See, and the adults get pretty big. You can see they're bigger than most, uh, most armadillidium, even when they're not fully grown. These can get really big. So, yeah, so this is yellow. Good, because that's what I was thinking. Somebody ex described it as green, and I thought, mm, I don't know. Looks yellow to me, but I, I have a hard time telling. So, see if I dig in here, I can see a ton of babies over here in the wet side. You can see some springtails, too. There's an adult that was just molting. There's a big old adult right there. Pretty big. They get wide. Okay. So some of you are on the fence about the green and the yellow, huh? I see. And some of you are, are more vehement about it. <laughs> okay, we'll go with that. That's cool. Collected mosses growing in greenhouses. I'm not sure if I've done that, but that does make sense that they do well in Vivaria. Um, so paper towels instead of sphagnum moss. Um, good question. I'm guessing if you did it right, it could be done. Um, partly because in labs, sometimes they use plaster of Paris as the main like moisture holding substrate. They just they let it solidify in the bottom of the enclosure and then moisten it, and then they'll put uh, leaves on top of it, and that seems to work. So Anthony, that I know of, I've never dealt with chytrid with any of my frogs that I've kept. Okay, so many of you are of the agreement that it's yellow, but there's a little bit of green in there, it sounds like. Why can't I get that to focus? I used rice vinegar for a fruit fly culture. Do you think this will work out? In terms of uh, using it to as an anti-mold agent? Is that what you mean, forest oasis? Okay, yeah, we don't need a whole lot more likes if we're going to hit 50, which would be awesome before we quit. We've only got about a minute. So let's see if we can do it. Well, I'd like to ask you all before we go... Um, well, I, I think I see yellow too, Newt, but I'm, I'm just not very confident about what I see there because of my color blindness. And oh, it looked like we hit 50. That's awesome. Thank you, everybody. I think it's been a while since we've gotten more than 50. Now we're above 50. That's so cool. Okay, I see what you're saying, Forest Oasis. So my recipe for um, the anti-mold agent with rice vinegar, it would probably work. I've usually used white vinegar for that, but I think it will probably work. So, all right. Well, it's just about time to uh, call it good. Thank you for the like spike, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. And I appreciate the, 
the support of all kinds. Um, and I hope you all have a great week. And catch my video on Friday. Thanks for watching.